All right, baby, Abolition 101, let's get it. Abolition is a political vision and organizing strategy that's directly opposed to the prison industrial complex. The vision is a society in which police, punishment, and prisons is not the go-to answer to our problems, but rather our communities are safer and healthier because they are supported, equipped, and empowered to care for each other. Abolition doesn't mean people won't do bad things, but it does mean that our current reliance on the PIC does little to reduce violence and harm and actually perpetuates dysfunction rather than protecting us from it. The strategy is twofold. Create, dismantle. Create the conditions that promote healthy and loving communities. It's not the most police places that are the safest is the ones with the most resources. Dismantle the power and reach of the PIC and the larger systems of white supremacy that demands it. This takes deconstructing our ideas of power, punishment, and justice, as well as more tangible actions. But if abolition is an end goal with reasonable steps, why scare people away with divisive language instead of just focusing on reform? That's because liberation don't happen on accident. If we don't clearly and boldly name the end goal, we ain't never gonna get there. Reform suggests that the system is broken and needs some updates or bug fixes. Abolition understands that the system is working exactly as designed, so we need a new system. All right, baby, let's talk about abolitionist responses to violence and harm. If all the police and prisons are gone, what's going to protect us from violent crime? First, we have to dispel the myth that police and prisons protect us from violence at all. The short-term protection some people experience from some crimes is a side effect, not function of the prison industrial complex. If the PIC protects us from anything, it's from having to seriously consider the humanity of others. We're kept safe by our ability to distinguish ourselves from the criminal or the antisocial. It protects us from the work of caring for each other because we're offered the convenience of carting people away. Many of the alternatives to police and prisons are not perfect and aren't one size fits all. But we can't get the sizing right if we stay relying on the PIC to solve our problem. The strategy of abolition understands that disappearing all the police and prisons right now at once is probably a bad idea because without strong alternatives in place, they'll just be remade under a different name. So while we create those alternatives, I think that we'll have to have police respond to violent crimes and nothing else. Prisons will have to be more humane and house only those who need immediate removal from others. This isn't to advocate for the PIC's legitimacy in our future, but to realistically tend to the psychological damage it's already done to us. All right, baby, another barrier to abolition is the cop in your head. It's a part of us that seeks to regulate other people's behavior through some threat of punishment. I know we spend a lot of time talking about these Karens that get into black people's business and then try to exercise some authority over them. But the instinct to put black people back in line is deeply rooted in all of our understanding of law and order. Policing has always been a means to protect property and status quo at the expense of marginalized people. In order for a system like that to thrive, to sell us on the high of being an authority figure in these small ways so that we're willing to dehumanize and objectify other people in order to taste it. It's no surprise that black people get the butt of this deal because our standards of acceptability are based on Eurocentric and white supremacist ideals. The cop in your head, just like the cops on the street, exists to maintain the systems we have and discourage any deviation. So the next time that you see somebody living their life, dressing how they want, talking how they want, and otherwise minding their own business and you feel something rise in you to correct police or regulate their behavior or worse instigate a punishment check yourself remove yourself and begin the work of abolishing that cop in your head all right let's talk about why i stress the language of abolition instead of defund or reform for many of us the first time we heard the term abolition is in the context of chattel slavery the movement to end the practice in its time was an incredibly polarizing and inconceivable idea. Many people pushed for more reasonable or less antagonistic alternatives to abolition, like ending the slave trade or allowing enslaved people to purchase their freedom or the law of free birth. These reforms to slavery were meant to address some of the consequences of the practice without totally upsetting American way of life or American profits. But abolitionists were determined to end slavery, period. And there was a lot of different ways that they went about achieving that goal, some through academia and legislative change, and others through violent insurrection, many of whom we still celebrate today. But even so, the 13th Amendment, which many of us learn ended slavery, only did so for those who had not and would not commit a crime, reforming slavery and setting the stage for its successor, the prison industrial complex. So when I say abolish police and prisons, I am purposefully aligning myself with my historical predecessors who refused the language of reform because the severity of the practice was never the issue. The practice itself was the issue. Less cops, safer prisons, these are strategies, checkpoints even, but is never the actual goal. I continue the demand for abolition because slavery never ended, it evolved. It refocused its attention on our most vulnerable because it can no longer justify having us all. So I refuse to move the goalposts to appease oppressive systems and those who benefit from them because that communicates that our liberation is negotiable. 
All right, baby, let's talk about accountability and consequences. A common misconception about abolition is that without police and prisons, there'll be no response to people harming each other. But abolition doesn't mean that there won't be consequences for people's actions. It means that the prison industrial complex creates unnatural consequences that are excessively and unequally applied, which actually reproduces harm instead of reducing it. In an abolitionist world, not only do we create the conditions for people to harm each other less, but we also create opportunities for people to take accountability for their actions when harm inevitably occurs. Taking accountability is an active process of admitting harm or wrongdoing, accepting the consequences, and making changes to behavior towards the goal of harm not happening again. Notice that consequences are an important part of that process, but they are just a part of that process. Whereas punishment focuses all of our energy on those consequences. But what if somebody refuses to take accountability? Do they just get away with it? Nah, of course not. When you live in a community, not only do harmful actions come with natural consequences, but refusing to take accountability is also a harmful action that should come with consequences. That'll vary between different communities and be different based on what the harm was and who's involved, but any justice framework that is letting people off the hook and not holding them accountable for their actions is not abolitionist by definition. All right, before we get into examples of natural consequences, there's a few things we gotta talk about first. One, accountability is an active process that requires a desire for right relationship with ourselves and others. So if an actor or survivor of violence doesn't wanna take part in the process, that can't be forced. But we can work to create the conditions that make those processes more feasible for more people. Second, abolition is always concerned with the root causes of harm. So the bulk of our energy goes towards prevention and intervention rather than reaction. The question of what do we do when X happens is important, but always comes second in priority to the question, what conditions can we create so that X is less likely to happen? Third, violence and abuse doesn't happen in a vacuum. So the actors of that abuse are mirrors for our communities. Accountability must be chosen by the community as a whole for lasting change to happen. And finally, there's no one size fits all solution to violence. Our communities are diverse, our circumstances are diverse, so our responses to violence must be diverse as well. That being said, here's an example of natural consequences for something like domestic partner violence. These consequences could be me losing access or communication to my partner and others harmed by my behavior. I could have limited access to spaces that the survivor or survivors frequent. People in overlapping communities may talk about and know about the violence that I cause, and I may be removed from positions of power that allow me to further exploit vulnerable people. All of these are natural consequences because they assert that abuse is not sustainable in a community without reproducing harm by stripping the abusive party of their basic needs or overall safety. This creates space for the survivor to decide what next steps make the most sense for them in their healing and maintain space for the abusive party to begin the work of reflecting, repenting, and growing without being distracted by further harm. And it gives the community an opportunity to examine itself and create the conditions for justice and healing instead of avoiding responsibility by relying on the criminal punishment system. They have to be completely honest in a relationship. Well, here's something I don't believe at all. Why not? Would you like me to tell you you've gained weight? Absolutely, but then you have to also be honest about why you're bringing it up. What do you mean? Well, it's important to be honest and let me know if you're bothered by it because you don't find me attractive anymore, or if you ask because you saw a change in me and wanna make sure that I'm okay and happy. How does that help? In one, you're concerned about your well-being. In the other, you're concerned about mine. What if I do struggle to find you attractive if you gain weight? Well, just be honest about it. That's one way ticket towards the fight. I'm falling for that. Well, if you fear confrontation means that we never really had intimacy and that you're living in a state of fear, you shouldn't be in a relationship at this point. So I should just say, dear, I've noticed that you gained some weight and it's making it harder for me to find you attractive. Yes, if that's what you think. But wouldn't you leave? Yes, I would. And being honest is not so great as you make it out to be. Why not? I got to discover that your attraction towards me is heavily dependent on the way I look. And since this is not one of my values, I can now make the informed decision of leaving this relationship and focus on finding a partner that shares my values in the same way that you can find a partner that shares yours. All thanks to honesty. Yeah, but this shouldn't lead to a breakup in my opinion. It should lead to a discussion. Well, okay, let's discuss. I don't like the fact that you find me attractive only if I look a certain way. It makes me feel unsafe and insecure and as if being smart 
smart, kind, capable, and all the other things that you like about me just fade away in comparison. Well, I understand what you feel, but don't you think that attraction also is based on how people look? <laughs> yes, if we know each other for five minutes, but in a relationship, my expectation would be that other things take precedence. I will weigh more or less throughout the years. I will maybe get ill. I will grow old. My appearances will inevitably change, and I want a partner that is realistic about that. I mean, the last thing that I want is to be in competition with someone 20 years younger just because you cannot accept change in my body. Can't you just try and lose weight? Can't you care less about my appearances? Touché. That's why it's so important to communicate your values from the beginning so that all parties can make an informed decision. If I knew from the beginning that physical aspect would trump any other aspect of me, I wouldn't have agreed to the relationship. Checkmate. Damn it. Ultimately, you're fooling yourself in this. Okay, girlies, it's time to talk about how Reagan destroyed the middle class. Before Reagan, the rich were taxed at about 70%, which means the poor had to pay a lesser amount. That meant that they could use the money that they saved on buying things and moving up. That created the middle class. AKA people who weren't filthy rich, but they could make enough money to buy a house and retire comfortably and even cover up the embarrassing tattoo that they got when they were 16 and drunk. Then Reagan majorly reduced rich people's taxes using trickle-down economics, which meant that if the rich are saving on taxes, they're going to use that money to hire more people to work for them. That will create more jobs and then that wealth will trickle down to the middle class. But that didn't happen because the rich hoard their wealth. Let's put it this way. Let's say a beauty brand gave everyone with below 100k followers two skincare products and everyone with over a million followers 20 skincare products because they'll just have so much and they'll just share it with everyone else. Do you think that they would? Is there such a thing as too much skincare? Yeah, rich people went from paying 70% tax to 20% tax and someone's going to pay for the 50% that's left over. Who's gonna do that? The middle class and the poor. Also, Reagan hated unions and severely restricted them, which just means that no one's gonna fight for the workers if the bosses took advantage of them, like didn't increase their wages. So now the middle class doesn't have enough money to buy a house or comfortably retire or cover up their embarrassing tattoos. They barely have enough money to make food and rent. The less they can afford things, the more income inequality goes up. So if you let me, I would like to ask one question to the ministers. Which ones? All the ministers, you have a question for all of them and you want them all to reply. They just so I need, need to go to home and get a thumbs change up. of clothes. They just need to give me a thumbs up. Ah, oh, that's a good one. Okay, go ahead. Go Thank ahead. Thank you. Especially the ministers from the Global North. Do you think that the people who are least responsible for the climate crisis and the ones who are suffering some of the worst impacts of this crisis deserve our help. Thumbs up. Higher up. So all of you believe that the people who are suffering right now deserve our help. So I'll ask a second question. Will your countries commit to putting money and finding loss and damage for those countries at COP27? <laughs> now that's where the problem is. My first question is like your statements. You're promising us. You're talking about what you're going to do. And my second question is about real action. Loss and damage is happening right now. We can't adapt to the loss of our cultures, the loss of our identities, the loss of our histories. We can't adapt to extinction or to starvation. We cannot adapt to loss and damage. So the first question equals to your statements, promises, pledges, sweet nothings. And the second question is about action. But everyone saw how the ministers were hesitant to say that their countries will commit to funding loss and damage at COP27 in Egypt. Thank you. So let me just... People are never obligated to disclose, but so long as Harry Styles is going around imitating queerness and capitalizing off of queerness while maintaining that he maneuvers the world as a white cis straight man, I'm wondering exactly who the people like him are that don't win very often. Because from where I'm sitting, white men who toe the line between am I aren't I queer succeed way more often than the black and brown and actual queer bodies in the same industry. I mean, Beyonce, who was up for album of the year for the fourth time, who actually had queer folk on the album, who actually shouted them out, lost. But somehow people like him don't win very often. So who are you? Because from where I'm sitting, you win all the time. So much so that nobody else can get a word in edgewise. 
First things first, real people can't queer bait. How you identify is your business, how you express yourself is your business, and how you choose to dress is not inherently an identifying factor of your gender or sexual identity. That being said, imitating queerness is why we respond to Harry Styles one way and Sam Smith another. Every time Harry Styles is asked about his sexual identity, which is usually around the time he has a project coming out, he gives a nondescript, I don't like labels kind of answer. Cool, that's his business. Then he gets on stage in his bright colored costume or his more feminine outfit, scoops up some pride flags, does his song and dance, gets off, the crowd goes crazy, he goes on with his life. Sam Smith came out as gay, then non-binary, dresses more femininely, and does the same outrageous performances. And I don't think they've known peace since. Harry Styles can profit off the fun and community of being queer without ever having to touch the oppression box. And that's not something that queer people who are out can do. Harry Styles can is he isn't he his way into his fourth house. And Sam Smith is going to continue getting slandered in the papers. All right, baby, we back with a reminder that Obama was a good president in the same way that your silly uncle was a good cop. The function of the position supersedes any personal virtues of their own. There are no good American presidents because the office has functioned to subjugate, dominate, and sacrifice the powerless other for the sake of the powerful. Contextually, those power dynamics are going to shift. Who is the powerful? Who is the powerless? But consider that we as American citizens have and continue to benefit from the Obama administration's decision to drop bombs on literal people, innocent people, under the guise of protecting us. The American government has a long history of doing things for the greater good that turn out to just be self-serving power grabs. Now, I truly believe that Obama was a better president than whatever the mess we got going on right now, but I think it's important for us to dispel the myth of good presidents because it allows us to reserve our energy, our love, and our admiration for our local leaders and the people in our communities. Because while they may not be as powerful as the president of the United States, they may be in a better position to actually create the conditions that lead to the liberation of us all. We can have different opinions and still be friends. Doesn't apply to human rights. I've had so many people comment on my videos, stuff like this. And like, it'll be like, the reason America is so divided is because people won't accept people's differences. And I'll be like, yeah, I agree. You know, people don't respect black people, Muslim people, gay people, you know? So yeah, that makes sense. And they'll be like, no, it's because people won't let me believe what I want to believe without judging me. Look at me, look at me. If you believe trans people shouldn't exist on the face of the earth, we cannot be friends. I'm sorry. Your beliefs and pushing your beliefs are getting people murdered. Like young black men who look like me are getting murdered by the police all the time. And you want me to be on your side that's murdering people who look like me. And then people always comment stuff like, oh, America's a free country. You should be able to believe in what you want without being judged. And it's like, yeah, you are. And I'm free to not talk to you. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? If you like pineapple on pizza, we can still be friends. Not if you don't support women's rights. And when I asked her what has been changing for her, she said it's student apathy. <sighs> I have seen teacher after teacher after teacher after teacher come onto TikTok and vent their grievances about how their students are just not working the way that students used to work. And as a teacher, I fully understand. I fully get it. These kids don't want to do work anymore. They just don't want to learn. They don't want to put in the work. They don't want to do their assignments. They don't want to do their homework. Have you stopped to ask why? The adults in the room put the country into a global pandemic and told the kids deal with it. The adults in the room created the internet and social media, and now these kids have to live with it. From the moment they are born, they see in full color HD every single day how the adults are screwing up the world and not making it a better place, and all the bad things that are going on across the world. You expect them to care about algebra and English when they are constantly depressed and worried? Give them a break. We are trying to apply educational standards from 10 years ago onto kids that are of a different generation, of a completely, di they're on another planet in terms of education. And we are the ones that need to adapt, not them. Give them a break. Give the kids a break. 90% of school is just busy work to pass a test at the end of the semester. Exams at the end of the year, SAT and SAT testing, and the one observation where your principal comes in the room, the kids know that those are the only days that really matter. How can you expect them to care when we are only really measuring how well they can pass a test at the end of the year? That's an awful lot of downtime, and we expect them to be 
on it every single day? Look out, look outside, look outside. Look at what the, look at what, look at what's going on. Look at what's happening. COVID, still here. School shootings every day. Oh yeah, school shootings, by the way. Oh, we expect them to work hard when they could be killed coming into school? God. We need to give these kids a break. We need to give these kids a break. We need to give these kids a break. They are not the ones who set the world on fire. We are the adults and it's up to us to give them a break. Thank you. Um, I've been seeing a lot of TikToks lately about people complaining about how hard it is to live in America and everything's more expensive and it's a third world country with a Gucci belt. And I just want you to know one thing. You are not crazy. That is fact. We rank 25th in the world for economic freedom, 129th in global peace, the land of the 15th freest, 15th, 17th for quality of life, 20th for gender equality, 18th for healthcare, but we spend more than anybody else. We have the lowest life expectancy for men and women of any country with a high GDP. We rank second to last in childcare quality. 29th in work-life balance, no surprises there. Pay attention, because this is a weird one. The scale for this one says that the number one country has the highest rate of poverty. What that means is 54 countries have a lower poverty rate than the richest country in the world. We do, however, rank number one in a few places. We are absolutely killing the game in the cost of college. Number one, baby! Scotland tried, but we do have the highest rate of overdoses. And you can always rest assured that you live in the richest country in the world, except that the richest 10% own 70% of the wealth and the bottom half are fighting over 2.5% of it. What I'm trying to say is if you feel like you're struggling just to survive right now and this seems like a bunch of bullshit, it's because it is a struggle to survive right now and it is a bunch of bullshit. I cannot thank you enough for this comment and I want to offer you a huge round of applause because you've done the most important thing that you can do when learning something from a stranger off the internet and that is checking their sources. If you're going to have a genuinely informed opinion, then you need to cultivate your opinion from a wide variety of sources, all with high levels of credibility. You want to look at organizations that lean left and organizations that lean right and see if they're both coming to the same conclusions. You also want to get on a website such as MediaBiasFactCheck.org where you can look up the organization and see how they rank. I'll let you check this out as you see fit, but here are some of the sources that I used for my last video. You'll notice that some of them are left-leaning, some of them are right-leaning, and some of them are deliberately nonpartisan. You'll also notice that they came from a variety of countries. One source is written by a PhD with a high-level position in this company, while others are foundations that are so easily recognizable that we regard them as credible, such as UNICEF and the World Economic Forum. I'll just get right down here in case you want to screenshot and uh, check them yourself. And here's the thing. If you find another credible source that has conflicting information, I want to hear about it. My opinion is constantly changing and yours should be too. Nobody on earth has all the answers and the answers are changing from time and circumstance. So this user looking at my video and questioning where I got my information from makes me so happy and hopeful for the future. It's exactly what we need. And I just want to ask a simple question. Why can't we leave trans people alone? Let them be who they are. Let them live their lives. Let's stop discriminating against them simply because they are different from we, who we are and different than what we understand. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean we shouldn't support the transgender community and love them in the same way we should love all human beings. They're not bothering anyone. They want to go to school. They want to play sports. They want to hang out with their friends. They want to live their lives. Let them live their lives. We have an ugly history of discriminating against people who are different than we are throughout our time in this country. Whether they are black, Latino, Asian, LGBTQ, poor, people with disabilities, women, we have an ugly history of discrimination in this country. And now the trans community is the target. All they want to do is live their lives. Why are Republicans so uncomfortable with this? Let them be who they are. That's it. They're not bothering you. They're not taking your lunch money. They're not criminalizing your communities. They're not engaging in gun violence. They just want to live and be happy like everyone else. And they are contributing members to society, whether it's through education, sports, the economy, or anything else. What the heck are, who are we as Americans and as a human race to be so darn uncomfortable 
with an individual or group of people that's different from who we are. From the beginning of American history, as we got our stuff together, as we tried to, we invited people from all over the world to help us build the nation that we have now. And we continue to try to evolve into the nation that we're capable of being. And no one should be left out of that, especially not the trans community, which is the most vulnerable community right now in our country. I just want my Republican colleagues to just take a breath, stop, relax. The trans community isn't bothering you. Let them live just like you want your friends and family to live and have freedom and have rights and have choice. Let the trans community have the same thing. Thank you and I yield back. Hey everyone, this is Rep AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and this is my first TikTok. Now, this is not only my first TikTok, but it is a TikTok about TikTok. Now, this week, the CEO of TikTok came and testified before Congress as there is growing rumblings and discussion over a nationwide ban on the app. Do I believe TikTok should be banned? No. Why should TikTok not be banned? First of all, I think it's important to discuss how unprecedented of a move this would be. The United States has never before banned a social media company from existence, from operating in our borders. And this is an app that has over 150 million Americans on it. Some of the arguments about banning TikTok have come in with respect to uh, discussions around Chinese surveillance and utilization of, of data that is tracked and the enormous amount of tracking uh, on US citizens that, and data that is harvested by TikTok. And they say, because of this egregious amount of data harvesting, we should ban this app. However, that doesn't really address the core of the issue, which is the fact that major social media companies are allowed to collect troves of deeply personal data about you that you don't know about without really any significant regulation whatsoever. In fact, the United States is one of the only developed nations in the world that has no significant data or privacy protection laws on the books. The EU, for example, has something known as the GDPR, which really forces an, an enormous amount of protection on individual users and the amount of data uh, that companies can collect about you without your knowledge. So to me, the solution here is not to ban an individual company, but to actually protect Americans from this kind of egregious data harvesting that companies can do without your significant ability to say no. And usually when the United States is proposing a very major move that has something to do with significant risk to national security, one of the first things that happens is that Congress receives a classified briefing. And I can tell you that Congress has not received a classified briefing around the allegations of national security risks regarding TikTok. So why would we be proposing a ban regarding such a significant issue without being clued in on this at all? It just doesn't feel right to me. And additionally, this case needs to be made to the public. We are a government by the people and for the people. And if we want to make a decision as significant as banning TikTok, and we believe, or someone believes, that there's really important information that the public deserves to know about why such a decision would be justified, that information should be shared with the public as well. But frankly, I think a lot of this is putting the cart before the horse because our first priority should be in protecting your ability to exist without social media companies harvesting and commodifying every single piece of data about you without you and without your consent. This is nothing new. White actors have taken roles designed for every ethnicity throughout Hollywood history. From John Wayne as Genghis Khan in The Conqueror. Your treacherous head is not safe on your shoulders. To the non-Puerto Rican Natalie Wood as Maria in West Side Story. Buenas noches. To the multiple instances of white actors playing Asian characters from Marlon Brando. Suck me by name, interpreter by profession. To, of course... This. You cannot go on or keep running in my bills! It's a performance the New York Times in 1961 actually praised as broadly exotic. Seriously. Yes, there's no shortage of roles for white actors playing non-white characters. The historical figure you're playing wasn't white? Not a problem. 
The contemporary figure you are playing wasn't white? Not a problem. The cartoon the movie was based on was entirely about non-white people? Not a problem. Your characters are named Esteban and Clara Trueva in the Isabel Allende novel the movie is based on? Right this way, Jeremy Irons and Meryl Streep. And even when a non-white person does score a major role, when they make the porn parody, guess what happens? Don't worry, I got this one. No blame. Clear your dick away. And when filmmakers get called out on whitewashing, the justification is less to do with black and white and more to do with green. Director Ridley Scott told Variety magazine he can't mount a $140 million film and say that my lead actor is Mohammed so-and-so from such-and-such. -such. Yeah, you needed the white-hot star power of whoever the fuck this guy is. And maybe all of this would be less egregious if any time an actor of color took on a traditionally white role, half the country didn't go ape shit. The appearance of a black stormtrooper in the first trailer for Star Wars The Force Awakens is causing a lot of chatter on social media, even some racist comments. Several people were apparently upset that the actress playing the character is African American. He'd be the first black Bond. The author of those Bond novels saying Elba is too, quote, street. Yes, if you're black, even if you're an actor who sometimes dresses like French Waldo, people will still say you're too street. And this isn't even getting into how movies about minorities will still put white people in the foreground. How are we supposed to believe Tom Cruise is the last samurai? This guy is the last samurai? This guy? This guy is the last samurai? This guy. This guy is the last samurai. Fuck you. So when you hear people say the Oscars are so white because the rules aren't there, just remember, the Academy gave Oscars for characters named Olan, Billy Kwan, and Luis Molina to actors named Louise, Linda, and William. All of which is enough to make you ask, Hollywood whitewashing, how is this still a thing?